Welcome. I'm Eric Fleming, host of A Moment with Eric Fleming, the podcast of our time. I want to personally thank you for listening to the podcast. If you like what you're hearing, then I need you to do a few things. First, I need subscribers. I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash a moment with Eric Fleming. Your subscription allows an independent podcaster like me the freedom to speak truth to power and to expand and improve the show. Second, leave a five-star review for the podcast on the streaming service you listen to it. That will help the podcast tremendously. Third, go to the website, momenteric.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast, leave reviews and comments, listen to past episodes, and even learn a little bit about your host. Lastly, don't keep this a secret like it's your own personal guilty pleasure. Tell someone else about the podcast. Encourage others to listen to the podcast and share the podcast on your social media platforms because it is time to make this moment a movement. Thanks in advance for supporting the podcast of our time. I hope you enjoy this episode as well. Hello, and welcome to another moment with Eric Fleming. I am your host, Eric Fleming. And today, we're going to focus this podcast on different crises that are going on outside the United States, uh, foreign crises. It's going to be a heavy focus on the Israeli-Hamas conflict, but we're going to touch on some other crises that's going on as well. But before we get into all that, it is time for a moment of news with Grace G. Thanks, Eric. The Colorado Supreme Court disqualified former President Donald Trump from the ballot in the state's presidential election next year due to his role in the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. The U.S. House of Representatives voted to authorize an impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden to examine if he improperly benefited from his son's foreign business dealings. Rudy Giuliani has been ordered to pay over $148 million in damages to two former Georgia election workers he defamed with false claims that they helped rig the 2020 election. A binder holding top-secret intelligence about Russia's attempt to influence the 2016 U.S. election, which was sent to the White House during the final days of Trump's presidency, is missing. A U.S. appeals court rejected an effort by former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows to move his Georgia 2020 election interference case to federal court. The family of a Darian Murray, an 11-year-old boy shot by a Mississippi police officer, is pursuing a civil lawsuit after a grand jury decided not to recommend criminal charges against the officer. A Virginia mother was sentenced to two years in prison for felony child neglect after her son shot his first grade teacher. Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed a law that allows state law enforcement to arrest people suspected of crossing the U.S.-Mexico border illegally. New York Governor Kathy Hochul has authorized a commission to consider reparations for the state's role in perpetuating historic discrimination against African Americans. The New York City Council voted to ban the use of solitary confinement in city jails. Actor Jonathan Majors was found guilty by a New York jury of assault and harassment against his ex-girlfriend. And a federal jury ordered a halt to the removal of a Confederate monument at Arlington National Cemetery. I am Grace G, and this has been a moment of news. Happy holidays. All right. Thank you, Grace. And now our first guest. Our first guest is Arena Zuckerman. Arena Zuckerman is a human rights and national security lawyer based in New York and a fellow at the Arabian Peninsula Institute. She runs a boutique national security law practice. She is a fellow at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. She is a member of the American Bar Association's Energy and Environment and Science and Technology sections. She is the program vice chair in the Oil and Gas Subcommittee. 
She is also a member of the New York City Bar Association's Middle East and Northern Affairs Committee, an affiliate member of the Foreign and Comparative Law Committee. In addition, Arena is the president of Scarab Rising Inc., a media and security strategic advisory, and the editor, editor-in-chief of The Washington Outsider, a project of Scarab Rising, focused on foreign policy, geopolitics, security, and human rights. Arena hosts the Washington Outsider Report program on the coalition radio station and frequently writes about world affairs in diverse U.S. and international publications. She has appeared in the media all over the world as a geopolitical specialist dedicated to actionable analysis, and her writings and comments have been translated to over a dozen languages. Arena is a member of the editorial board of the Maghreb and Orient Courier. She is a member of the New York-based Foreign Policy Association. Arena specializes in information warfare. She has written and spoken extensively on active measures by Russia, China, and Iran, and influence campaigns by Middle Eastern state actors, as well as on the impact of active measures and influence campaigns on the human rights and NGO world. She has also published a wide range of global issues touching on energy, geostrategy, strategic alliances, great power competition, and its impact on geopolitics, domestic policy, and business, information security, and digital rights, cybersecurity, big tech, terrorism, and extremism, as well as issues in intelligence and counterintelligence. Most recently, Arena was honored for her contributions as a woman leader and as a global humanitarian at the World Humanitarian Drive's Trilateral Trade for Peace Conference in London. Her comments and writings have been translated in over a dozen languages. Her latest major appearance was on Australia's number one podcast, The Red Line, to discuss counterterrorism and economic warfare in Mozambique. Arena just moderated a high-profile panel on the legal framework for understanding information warfare in Ukraine at the New York City Bar Association. She most recently presented at Character Assassination, Illiberalism, and the Erosion of Civic Rights Conference by Character Assassination and Repudiation Politics Lab at George Mason University and the University of Amsterdam. Arena was recently honored with a Certificate of Appreciation from Ukraine's Center for Strategic Communications and Information Security for her work in countering Russian dis- disinformation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and privilege to have, as a guest on this podcast, Arena Zuckerman. All right, Arena Zuckerman, how are you doing? Doing well. Thank you for inv- inviting me today. Well, I'm honored to have you um, because I want to pick your brain about a lot of the stuff that's going on, and I noticed that you have been out here in the in the community online and on podcasts and all that stuff talking about different human rights crises that have been going on around the world so i wanted to get you on on this podcast um and what i normally do with a guest is that i i try to find a quote that relates to the work that they're doing or something that they may have said or written in a book or something like that so um your quote is all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. What does that quote mean to you? Quite frankly, I think human beings have have a a a spark, a soul inside them, all of them. And no matter who, who they are, what background they come from, they're endowed with inalienable rights that come from God. And I, I believe that the, these rights are not created by human beings, they're not given by human beings, they are there. And in that respect, I I try to look personally, and I, and I hope the, the 
you know that everyone does the same but unless it's not the case to look past labels to look past backgrounds to look past categories that people put towards each other and look at individuals and whether or not how they behave how they act and whether or not they they work in accordance with their human spirit uh with their values um with respect to one another or whether or not they abandon those values in favor of personal agendas or agendas that are not accord uh, accordance in accordance with trying uh to bring humanity uh to the world around them yes ma'am um describe the role mission of the washington outsider what is the mission of that publication i am striving to bring diverse perspectives from around the world and around the country on issues that are frequently overlooked uh poorly understood or just not well covered and i'm striving to be to bring together a mixture of known experts in in the fields and different voices that don't generally get that recognition from within and outside the washington bubble as they call it because also frequently our policymakers there uh end up being cut off from the from the discourse around the country around their own voters and constituents, much less the rest of the world, and end up writing and publicizing and sharing ideas that are poorly thought out, not based in a complete understanding of different factors that uh, that should contribute towards reason, reason, well-reasoned policy, and just simply come come off as people who just don't really understand their work all that well. So I'm trying to help bridge that gap between different voices and their opinions and perspectives and facts and the decision makers who have to then bring all these ideas together, analyze them and come up with a response. All right. So now the reason I ask that it, you, you've come across a little controversy from what I understand. Uh, you've been banned on Twitter or X, if that's what they want to call it now. What what's the story behind that? Why why did they put that on you? Especially since Mr. Musk says that he wants all viewpoints to to have a platform. Uh, why why did they exercise that with you? Well, the story actually started before Mr. Musk, and that is what makes it so fascinating because I've <laughs> I've now <laughs> apparently been too much for two Twitter regimes. <laughs> um, so. Uh, I, I may be one of the unique examples of that, you know, outside terrorist organizations and and people of that sort. So the story started in a way that may sound very boring and uh, uninteresting to most people. It started with me uh, publicizing a flyer about an interview that I did for my show, for my own uh, video podcast, which was going to be... Um, with an American digital forensics specialist uh, uh, who was pursuing and is still pursuing a PhD in that area named uh, Jonathan Scott. Uh, and the interview was about his academic report, uh, not an official paper, not a university publication, but his own independent research um, into uh, into allegations regarding the use of spy uh, of a particular type of spyware, and he went through reports publicized by the digital rights NGO um, that was making those allegations, and realized that first the information they were pro- providing publicly was incomplete. Second, uh, the way they conducted their academic work, which garnered huge response around the world, and caused a lot of controversy in publications and media on political issues. Uh, It was not up to academic standards. It was operating more like a political think tank than an independent academic advisory, which it purported to be. And third, it, it, it was not transparent. It was not verifiable. And the it was not being peer reviewed. The reviewers that were engaging in that research they were all from partner institutions and interchangeable with the researchers at that particular group. 
So I thought that was very interesting because while I'm no technical specialist, I've, as someone who is in the human rights field, I have reviewed those reports uh, previously and found questionable issues there. And I wanted to see what somebody with a background in this area would have to say about that. Uh, so I publicized this report. And even before that interview aired, um, I was attacked by anonymous as well as blue check mark at the time, the, the legacy check marks accounts from a variety of different sources, but all in some way connected to that particular NGO, discouraging me from publishing the interview. By the way, there was nothing about the questions I asked or what this person had to say to me uh, in the flyer. They had no way of knowing or what the conversation would be like or how it would end. But they presumed, based on my own work, that it would be biased and that I would be giving this person a platform to, you know, without any questions or uh, and so forth. Uh, they presumed yeah. incorrectly. I told them that they should watch the interview before casting judgment. And I also told them that in the interview, I would be providing, I would be, I would be calling for that organization to participate in a future interview with me and to give them equal space to um, respond to whatever he had to say. And nevertheless, they wanted me complete, to ban this person from a show completely. They said that giving some idea space was dangerous. And this is something that I strongly disagree with. I do, I do agree, of course, that there are bad ideas and good ideas, that there's no reason to give unfettered platform to bad ideas. But I think that all ideas should be confronted and questioned whether they're good, bad, or something that could be used either way. And in that particular interview, this was nothing more than a person presenting evidence of his work. He was not, you know, he has had issues with different groups of technical specialists, and that's their personal business. But at the end of the day, listeners can judge for themselves, and they can raise questions, and they can, um, you know, I always welcome uh, I always welcome alternative viewpoints, and I always give space to people I disagree with as well. And I, I, I felt that if I found something in his work that was lacking um, in technical expertise, I would be more than happy to push back during the interview, as I have done with other guests in the past. Well, I was actually threatened before the interview ever, uh, came out. They threatened my reputation. They threatened that. Uh, uh, you know, I, uh, they compared me to quote unquote climate change denialists and assorted other people. And I, I did not appreciate that. I told them uh, that they're welcome to raise questions after the interview, not before, uh, but not tell me what to do and how to conduct my show. After the show, they aired, uh, uh, you know, all controversy, controversy erupted. And a week later, I found that my account was banned completely permanently, not just the account itself, but me as a person uh, was banned with no possibility of returning to Twitter at all, without any warning and without any standard procedure that Twitter uh, was uh, um, accountable to, uh, which meant that they would have to give repeated warnings of violations, they would have to provide the reason for why the account was being banned, and they had to give an opportunity to appeal. I had no, none of that came to pass. and. All my um, attempts to appeal this decision and raise questions about why I was being banned were met with silence. But what I learned later is that it was mass reported by some of those accounts and likely they had someone on the inside who was also cooperating. So I found that very disgraceful. Uh, some of these accounts continued to harass me on other social media and tried to report me. They went after my professional license as a lawyer, of course, with no result because nothing I did was professional and inappropriate. Uh, they quite, tried, quite frankly tried to shut down the speech they did not like without even uh, raising questions about what specifically was wrong with anything either was said other than they disagreed, disagreed with it. Yeah. And interestingly enough, one of them contacted me, one of the biggest accounts going after me, contacted me through an intermediary uh, on, on another professional account and offered the quid pro quo to have my account restored in exchange of me denouncing this interview, denouncing my research into this area, and denouncing my various 
uh, views on foreign policy and issues that are written about and that are in no way related to that particular uh, particular segment, uh, which I refused to do. And of course, my, the access was not re restored. When Musk came and uh, purchased, uh, completed his takeover of Twitter, I saw that there was an opportunity to, with the change of ownership, to relitigate this issue. And so I once again appealed the decision and initially received no response. So I got people who knew Elon Musk personally to tag him on Twitter, and he indeed restored some of the other accounts that were um, mentioned in those mentions almost immediately. I couldn't understand what was going on. Uh, why was my account not, why was I not getting a response? So finally, uh, Twitter came back to me and said that essentially, uh, I w they accused me not of spreading disinformation as those accounts were falsely claiming, but of assuming somebody else's identity, believe it or not. Hmm. I had, yeah, I had actually, um, those uh, same accounts created another account on Twitter with my name on it and my likeness uh, um, as, a, as an avatar. And essentially, was spreading disinformation about me, and some people who didn't follow my account too closely actually started following them, thinking that it was me. It was quite shocking, really. I reported that account multiple times, as did other people, and it was never removed. So I sent a copy of my passport to Twitter and said, this is who I am. My account dates back to 2008. That account was created a couple months ago. You judge for yourself which one is real. Um, they did not respond. They actually responded and said that I still, based on the evidence, they still believe me to be an imposter. So I resent that information. I said, look, I am providing you with my own a federal identification, what can that account provide you with to show that they are who they claim to be? And after that, there was silence. I was, no matter how many times I appealed, there was never a single response. Meanwhile, the same accounts continued to harass me. And eventually, my uh, they wrote articles about me in big media. Uh, they attacked me. my other work, they harassed journalists who quoted me. And to, long story short, I found out that they were connected to Russian trolls and to various other uh, uh, malicious entities around the globe that were uh, cooperating together and uh, they had an agenda and they had connections in social media companies and that was that. Well, I, I'm glad that you gave a detailed account of what happened and I, I, I understand the spirit of why you wanted to interview that person because I, I have the same kind of platform on that. So I'm glad you addressed it. And now I want to pick your brain about this human rights stuff. Okay. Sure. <laughs> All right. Um, so, and we've got a limited amount of time, but I, I, I do want to talk to me about what's going on in the Sudan. Cause we don't, we don't hear a lot in the United States about what's going on with these different African conflicts. And my experience, well, my interpretation of what happened in Sudan is I, I consider it the conflict that climate change created. And my reasoning for that is Lake Chad, you know, was the largest lake in, in the world. And it is greatly diminished in size. And so because of that, all this land was found. And in this land, there was oil and, and, and gold and other uh, minerals and stuff. And so the Sudanese faction started fighting over that land. And I guess now it's led to uh, the creation of another country, southern Sudan. But there's still a conflict between amongst the Sudanese people. So kind of, you know, with the listeners kind of, and I hate to say briefly, but kind of break down what's going on in the Sudan right now. That's a human rights crisis. Well, what you mentioned is indeed points to one of the conflicts that is ongoing, but that is actually at the current uh, time the lesser of the uh, conflicts, and it's uh, the, uh, the that territorial dispute over claims to oil and to water has been ongoing for a while and doesn't appear to have a a resolution at the moment, but it seems to be heading in the direction eventually. 
a much bigger problem right now is the conflict between um, internal factions, not with South Sudan, but in Sudan itself, uh, between the SAF, uh, which represents the ruling uh, government faction, and uh, General Al Burhan, and um, and RSF, the Rapid uh, uh, Support Forces, that you, that emerged from the former Janjaweed uh, militias uh, uh, and the warlord slash general, uh, who is well known as Hemeti. And essentially, it's a struggle over power. It's a struggle that has uh, prevented humanitarian aid from reaching civilian populations. And it gives no consideration to, to uh, human rights concerns. Both factions fighting have been uh, abusive of human rights. Uh, there's been a, a huge displacement of millions uh, of people, and many of them fled abroad while others have been internally displaced. And uh, uh, there's been massacres, particularly in Darfur most recently. Darfur in the past has been um, uh, a subject of controversy over uh, <clears throat> over conflicts and ethnic cleansing and even uh, claims to genocide between Arabic and uh, black tribes. Uh, but now we're seeing uh, something that surpasses even that, because now you have uh, political factions, sectarian control between pro-RSF groups that are there and uh, and others. Uh, there was a horrifying massacre uh, not so long ago when over 800 Sudanese civilians were massacred in, the four, in one day. And uh, similar incidents have been taking place throughout the summer, since the war started in April. Uh, one, there was a previous incident where over 200 people were massacred in a span of hours, essentially. Um, and unfortunately, there seems to be no way to stop it. And both factions have geopolitical backers with their own interests in uh, internal affairs. Some have interest in gold mines that Sudan is fond of. Some have uh, interest in their own regional security and whoever is uh, closer to them. Um, there's all sorts of interests involved, but there are countries that are in no way allied with each other that uh, that strangely and mysteriously end up backing various factions. And by the way, some of these, um, uh, some of the groups that have backed each of these conflicting factions have switched sides throughout the conflict. Chad at one point uh, backed one side and it changed, uh, changed sides uh, and so forth. So the U.S. currently is backing more or less the official government, Al Burhan's government. Uh, the Al Burhan's government has uh, consists of very traditional military uh, groups. Uh, they have ousted the uh, civilian transition government a couple of years ago. Since then, some of the Al Bashir, the Islamist government that preceded them, has returned to the fold um, as a way against RSF. RSF is not religious. But it is a very much um, a group of ex-criminals who have been previously created by the previous iterations of the governments to do their dirty work throughout the country. And now oh, there's no holds bar. Oh, they're just fighting each other to the death. And until either side's resources are exhausted uh, and until they stop receiving backing from these various backers, there's no, there seems to be no end to end the, the human rights crisis that's taking place, the attacks on civilians by the military, the indiscriminate killing and, and so forth. So in a, in a quick, in an estimate, how many people have been displaced and how many people have been killed in this conflict? Up to 10 million have been displaced so far. Um, the the exact numbers of uh, over the dead uh, are hard to estimate because of the of the situation on the ground. But as you have seen from the numbers, there's been hundreds killed in just spans of days. So you can imagine that the figures are up there. Okay. Um, several members of the U.S. Congress were upset when uh, President Biden hosted Prime Minister Modi of India. Explain to the listeners what's going on in that country. Why were those members of Congress not feeling that this guy should have a steak dinner? There's been a lot of controversy over India. Uh, in fact, there is even a new scandal that's going on, but that is not. Uh, but that that but this latest scandal 
uh, those issues that you mentioned previously preceded this uh, latest development. They, th those members of Congress claimed that India uh, is violating human rights, that it's not really a free country, and that it's an uh, anti-minority. Frankly, I've heard very conflicting assessments of what's actually going on inside the government depends depending on who you ask. There are groups within that country that are separatist and people who are more co closely aligned with those guys do feel that the government is using exceeding force or that they essentially being uh, demagogic in the way they use various issues uh, to create this sort of national unity and uh, therefore downplay Play, downplay the concerns and interests of those various groups. Uh, then there are groups claiming that there is a Muslim-Hindu divide inside the country. Uh, there is certainly no issue, no, no shortage of local issues between local uh, groups. Uh, and uh, there, there are people who claim that Modi, before becoming the prime minister, he was uh, at one point banned from entering the United States along with other officials. They claim that he made excuses for a violent lynching incident where uh, Muslims were killed. Since then, however, um, since then, however, the official rhetoric has not been uh, that there is um, a huge community of Muslims inside India, over 100 million people, and the overwhelming majority of them are very much, um, in in many ways, benefiting from the direction India is pursuing at this point in time. Could things be? Better, yes, but um, there's a huge difference between ethnic tensions in a country of well over a billion people, a billion coming up on a billion and a half, and the government deliberately inciting violence. On the contrary, uh, a lot of the Muslims in the um, in the country are working closely with the government to uh, address incitement by various radical groups and radical. Um, Islamist groups. There are also groups of radical Hindu activists, uh, but uh, there is no general perception, I would say, that the government is exactly strictly speaking with them. Do those radical Hindu activists support the government? Sure. But does the government support them? That's a different story. Does it benefit from their votes? To some extent. Would it be better if it completely cut them off and cut off any sign of support? Probably. Is it the same as to claim that the government is um, actively involved in human rights abuses? Absolutely. There is a stark difference, and I think it's a very unfair comparison that has been actually deliberately backed by some of the A, opposition parties inside India, and B, radical Islamists who have been also working hard to create a polarization between the Muslim community and everybody else. All right. So... Your final question, because I don't, I don't want to um, take up too much more of your time, but what do you think of, of all the stuff that you're monitoring? Because uh, you're monitoring stuff all over the globe. What is the biggest human rights crisis that is going on now? And is there any way to to remedy it or stop it or whatever what what do you think is the biggest crisis right now oh gosh i'm very torn between two forgotten crises uh one in, uh I, I will focus on human rights and not strictly speaking humanitarian because if you go and j just talk about humanitarian crisis i would say a number of countries in africa um are probably some of the top contenders but if you're talking about deliberate human rights violations, but, but for targeted entities, I would, I would say the top two contenders are Yemen and, and Afghanistan because of what's going on. Yemen is has been torn up by the civil war, the Houthis, that are, um, uh, a militia uh, that has at one point been uh, designated as a terrorist organization by the U.S. and it's backed by Iran, that considers and boasts itself to be more radical uh, than Iran has been extremely abusive towards women, journalists, literally anyone who disagrees with them, other ethnic groups and religious groups and uh, other Muslim groups, they have been uh, torn up. That's not to say that the official government, uh, legitimate government has been perfect. There's also been complaints about uh, shortage, uh, shortage of opportunities for women and internal sectarian tensions among various groups. So 
it's a it's a complete disaster it's very close to a failed state with afghanistan i don't need to tell anyone what happened after the taliban take over not only there is uh, according to un reports even though the us does not recognize it officially but according to the un reports which i personally found credible there's a proliferation of terrorist organizations growing there's a uh, been a a spike in abuses against women who've been once again banned from uh, entering education and uh, pursuing jobs outside their homes they cannot leave uh, there's a form of extreme guardianship uh, system where women cannot uh, leave their homes without a male relative accompanying them and there's been reprisals against political enemies such as the members of the former government u.s allies uh, minorities um and uh, there's also an economic disaster from which the taliban benefits they they essentially uh distribute uh, prioritize their own supporters and networks in distribution of humanitarian aid leaving everybody else uh to the point of near starvation and various disasters that have shaken uh afghanistan since the time including earthquakes and and horrible winters have led to a compounding of uh, of these issues on top of this horrific targeting of people mass lynchings disappearances tortures in prison that are being completely underreported so between these two uh situations that say that comparatively speaking they are right now at this moment by far the worst that's not to say that there haven't been horrible massacres um perpetrated in various other places but in terms of ongoing uncontrollable situation that's been going on for years and that and where, and where there is no uh, particular solution inside those those two i would say are the worst all right so Next time we're going to get you on, we ain't got to deal with the controversy. We already addressed with that. And we'll have more time to get into some other crisis that's going on in the world. In the meantime, how can people get in touch with you, get uh, hooked into the Washington Outsider? Go ahead and make your pitch on that. Well, I'm available by email anytime. Uh, that's the email that you sent me. Uh uh, Irina Tsukerman at gmail.com or also S-I-C-A-T-222 at gmail.com. I am on LinkedIn and Facebook and I answer uh, messages there. Uh, I'm quite active. Um, and of course, the Washington Outsider uh, dot, um, dot com. The Washington Outsider is one word. That's the website for, for articles. You can uh, pitch me articles for publications. And you can also check out my podcast on uh, uh, on the coalition radio, uh, the Washington Outsider Report, where I interview different people on, uh, by video uh, and the whole in-depth discussions about major global and national issues that often uh, get overlooked or lack from a diversity of views. Um, that's a weekly event uh, that's taking place, and the next uh, episode is going to air Tuesday night at 9 p.m. And of course, for those who are looking to see uh, my past media appearances, you can check my YouTube channel, which is also the Washington Outsider YouTube channel and holds past programs by the Washington Outsider Report, as well as other events that I've done through the Washington Outsider or independently. And the Washington Outsider Substack, where I post links and newsletters with links to my media appearances and other work. All right. Arena Zuckerman, I thank you uh, for coming on and, and taking the time to come on this podcast. And like I said, we're going to get you back on because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world that I think my listeners and a lot of other people need to be paying attention to other than what we have been dealing with, whatever the media will cover here. But I think it's important, especially in the on the African continent, I think it's really important to highlight some of those things. So we'll get into that the next time I get you on. Okay. Absolutely. And thank you so much for this opportunity. It was a real pleasure. All right. Uh, Merry Christmas to you. And thank you. Uh, and you too. All right. And we'll catch y'all on the other side.
All right, and we are back. And so now, our next guest. Her name is Patricia DiGennaro. Patricia DiGennaro is a geopolitical analyst and strategic change consultant. Prior to this position, she was a subject matter expert for the Balkans Next Research Initiative at Joint Special Operations University on MacDill Air Force Base and a senior political scientist in support of the U.S. Central Command. In past years, he was a subject matter expert on the Middle East and Afghanistan for the U.S. Army's Training and Doctrine Command Operational Environment Training Support Center, a professor at New York University's Department of International Affairs, and a visiting scholar at George Mason University School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. DeGennaro capitalizes on over 20 years of experience as an academic, military advisor, and practitioner in international security policy. Much of her work focuses on geopolitical analysis, strategic communications, countering terrorism, and violent extremism, and translating nations, transitioning nations, from war. She has spent considerable time in the Balkans, the Middle East, and Afghanistan on information operations, security policy, civilian and military affairs, provincial governance, capacity building, and joint interagency, intergovernmental, and multinational coordination. DeGennaro holds an MBA in international trade and finance from George Washington University and an MA in international security policy and conflict resolution from Harvard University. She speaks fluent Albanian and knowledge of Italian, Arabic, and Dari. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and privilege to have as a guest on this podcast, Patricia DeGennaro. All right, Patricia DeGennaro, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing lovely. I'm glad to get you on. Um because you have been recognized by generals and heads of state and and other important people as being an authority about foreign affairs and national security and all that. So to have you come on my little old podcast is an honor and a privilege. So I thank you again for that. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege for me as well. Yes, ma'am. All right. So what I normally do with a guest if I can, is that I find a quote, either something they said, something related to their work or whatever, and then, you know, have them give their take on that particular quote. So your quote actually is kind of long, but I think it's important because it touches on something that we may not get into in the discussion. Understanding and engaging in the human domain is essential if you are trying to change, inform, or shape human behavior. The world's populations are becoming more interactive, which can potentially help or harm international security. With ever-increasing information, mediums, and venues, previously unconnected persons can connect and act in seconds. These emerging human geography trends responses to social and cultural grievances, adversarial patterns, and diverse community reactions continue to cause problems for U.S. forces and mission success. Knowing the human domain, therefore, gives commanders the ability to see, sense, anticipate, and maneuver through the complexities of peoples. Talk to me about that quote. Well, I think one of the things that hurts our foreign policy as American foreign policy or U.S. foreign policy is we often don't read other cultures, other people, other individuals very well. And in another quote (laughs) by a Vietnam general that uh, I always think about is... um, there was a discussion and the Americans said, well, we won every battle and the Vietnam, you know, general looked back at him and said, well, that does, that's irrelevant. So no matter how many battles you win, you don't win your overall mission or get to where you'd like to be without understanding people. 
And I think it's the most important aspect of working in a foreign policy, international security domain, because then we can prevent reactions instead of engagement and actions where we speak together, cooperate, talk together, get out what we like or don't like, and really understand history and why people behave or just make decisions the way they do. I think it's been discussed quite a bit in your, you know, after our, our interventions and invasions in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I think we're seeing it play out again right now in, in the Israeli-Palestinian violence that has reignited yet again in that region. People either don't take the time to understand, they don't want to understand, or they're just too self-consumed to understand. And I think sometimes we're very ethnocentric, so we ignore um, what's important to others, and therefore it really hurts our decision making and it, it hurts our ability to to make the world better and not to have so much violence and and to cooperate and, and have a win-win environment instead of a win-lose environment, which is where our head space is really at these days. So Afghanistan was the first country I thought of when, when I read that quote. Um, and I think it's not just the United States problem because Russia tried to deal with them too. And they, I don't think they were in as long as we were, but um, just the fact that they didn't understand who they were fighting um, or, or really what the end game was uh, is the reason why both of those countries kind of came out and the Taliban still in charge. Right. Um, right. So that answer that you gave leads to my next question, but I'm going to couch it this way. In 2015, you criticized the Obama administration concerning Syria by saying the U.S. is once again intervening in Middle East, in the Middle East with no plan, no idea, no clue, and no thinking about how to shape this into a positive outcome. Are we doing better in responding to the current Israeli-Hamas conflict? Yeah, I think this has been the problem in the Middle East a long time. It has quite a history. It has a colonial history, which um, those grievances yet haven't been resolved. Um, although the countries have been trying to deal with them more successfully than we've been able, you know, to to really understand. I think we got kicked out of those countries. We being the West, I guess I would say, in this particular aspect. Um, but no, I don't think we understand. I don't think we understand the policies that um, we're implementing and how they're affecting not only the, how they're affecting current generations and future generations. So not only people that are there that have been through this. Um, I think Syria, for example, um, was a country that was going down a, a good trajectory when we decided to intervene there. Um, that tra trajectory was opening more doors to capitalism. It's a very secular country or non-secular country. <laughs> so it's, it's not about, you know, it's not wed to religion basically there. Women were very treated very equally to men. Um, you know, so it had a lot of positive aspects that I think Western nations would, would have been able to engage with and deal with at a better level so they could understand the region and continue to understand the dynamics of the region better. We decided to interfere. We caused a really opening for a lot of internal grievances to be um, laid out within the context of the population there. So the Kurdish people have a lot of grievances in the north. You know, people have gr had grievances against a lot of the colonialization that had happened in the past by, by um, the Western powers. They had grievances against the administration 
And I think if we had helped them in other ways evolve more positively, you wouldn't have seen that. But our interventions seem to encourage violence, where um, we had, you know, the ambassador of Syria going down to the demonstrations and, you know, encouraging throwing tomatoes at the, you know, at the Assad supporters. So, I mean, when we do things like this, I, I think it's, it's it's really um, it, it, you know it it breeds a lot more violence volatility and it causes chaos and it doesn't seem to me that our policymakers and our our you know really idea our values in in American thinking and society are to cause chaos you know I've been in this this um, I've been, you know, in international security uh, in either development diplomacy or military advisement in very different capacities. And all along, it's been very clear um, that stability is really our focus. Why do we want stability? We don't want wars, right? Because the wars defeat economic prosperity. It also defeats, you know, the future purposes of us being able to work with engaged with other countries to solve complex problems. Climate change is one of them. The climate change um, you know, discussions are going on in the United Arab Emirates. And I think we've kind of lost our way as a leader in stabilization and economic prosperity, uh, which we had, we had claimed <laughs> at least to to be promoting and democracy upon that uh, during the Cold War. And I think, you know, what happened unfortunately is after the Cold War, the military all of a sudden was the solution. It was a solution in Bosnia. It was the solution in Kosovo for a while. It was the solution and has been the solution in Israel, Palestine for a long time. It became the solution in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. And I think we've we've really lost track of the solution being human. And that goes back to my original quote that you pulled out. And thank you very much for that. That's humbling. Um, but if you don't know how to deal and relate to humans, this is what we're going to see. We've seen violence rise internationally, globally, at a high, it's at the highest rate it's been since World War II. And I find this very troubling. So also Ukraine, I mean, why, we are usually ones that go in with a diplomatic solution, you know, immediately to stop the violence from happening. And it just doesn't seem to be our MO anymore. So I think we've lost track of that. And so if chaos is our mission, we're winning that, but I really don't think that that's what we want for the world. And most Americans see that as our place. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because, and this is kind of deviating a little bit from what I want to ask you, but, you know, after World War II, Roosevelt said there were four policemen, right? It was the United States, United Kingdom, China, and Russia. Now, it's kind of hard for the four policemen to kind of push when one is thinking about invading the country, one has already invaded the country, and, you know, the UK is just kind of like, well, we don't have the resources. So, you know, yeah. and then, you know, so I, I don't I don't know. It's just kind of like when you use the police analogy, I'm thinking the United States is more of a police force that has now become more stop and frisk instead of community policing, right? So, um, and I, I hopefully that analogy connects with what you were saying, but that, I, I just, I was just thinking about that. I was like, yeah, if the four, the four policemen are kind of, <laughs> kind of gone rogue at this particular point and they're not unified in, in trying to stabilize the world. So uh, I definitely agree mm -hmm. with your point. Uh, I wish there was more diplomacy than it was violence and um but anyway that's me philosophizing let's get back to the interview so <laughs> is it realistic in our lifetime to believe that a two-state solution can be achieved between israel and the palestinians and what is the real barrier towards achieving that solution 
Well, I've been following this conflict since the early mid '80s, I guess I would say, um, when I was when I was young and impressionable. But now <laughs> I'm, I'm more cynical and older. <laughs> um, so I think it, you know during the Madrid Peace Conference, we were all really hopeful, and I I think we really lost a major opportunity here. And I think that major opportunity is the fact that the U.S. does in this case. Um, give Israel so much monetary, political, and, and every other type of support that they would have probably not survived if that did not happen. Um, so I think that the leverage from us could have been pushed uh, very diplomatically uh, in that effort. Unfortunately, um, there were, you know, there were other events that happened between now and then, and I think one of the most important was the assassination of Ravine, when I, Ravine was very, very close to an uh, agreement with the two-state solution and unfortunately was assassinated by, by a very right-wing nationalist settler um, there. I think since that time, unfortunately, what's happened is Israel has progressively um, taken more land and caused more and more problems for Palestinians. Um, and what I mean is then they become confined because I'm taking land, you become confined in certain areas and your movement is very limited. And it, even though you can move most of the time it's controlled. Um, and within the last several years, I think the violence well, I know the violence has risen quite a bit in the West Bank and has been going on and off between Hamas and the Israeli Defense Force, you know, probably since 20, you know, just 2014, it's been nonstop. We've had a bit of a lull there in the last couple of years, um, but that, of course, uh, immediately was extinguished as soon as um, Hamas made those attacks on, on 7 October. Part of me thinks that the only way to resolve this is a two-state solution. The, the, I guess the reservations that I have is where are we going to put <laughs> four, you know, four to six million people um, now that the land has been reduced to very small Oh, I, I, I lost the audio for you for a minute. No, I'm, I'm still not, I'm still not getting anything. Can you hear me? Uh -oh. I can't, I can't hear you. And she, She's still talking. Can you oh. hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we got you back. Okay, good. Now, I know you were saying some good stuff right then. Uh, <laughs> so you were saying about the uh, trying to figure out where we're going to put these four to six million people. How's that? Okay, that's good. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. I apologize for that. I don't know where I left. It, well, I was saying it was you. You were talking about when we lost the audio. It was like four to four million people that are displaced, and you were talking about the struggle right. to try to find a place for them. So right. So there, there are there are estimates of four to six million. It's really hard to to tell. Um, sometimes, but the, you know, that's about it. So where are we going to put them? And now that the land has been basically systematically um, taken over by Israeli settlements um, in the West Bank and, and Gaza is a very small area, about 27, you know, miles from north to south, and you already have close to 2 million people there. I, you know, I think there can be maybe something done there if you get really inventive and creative, um, which I think in this day and age we can. 
How, however, I, you know, I'm not sure that that that's I'm not sure that that's going to solve the problem unless they also are have the opportunity for their own self determination and their own ability to move around freely and build and produce within the country, which is all controlled right now um, by the Israeli government. I mean, the taxes they take are controlled by the Israeli government. Water is controlled by the Israeli government. Services are controlled um, by the Israeli government. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very um, complicated situation. I don't think it's, it's something that can't be resolved, but I, I think if, um, you, you know, the, the, the both sides are no and no, you know, if, if Israel says, I want peace, but does nothing, uh, while Palestinians are still getting their land confiscated, you're, we're, we're getting to a zero, zero game here. Right. And I, that, that is kind of where we are right now. Um, and I really wish that the international community as a whole, including the Arab states who, who have power and now have made um, and opened relationships with Israel that actually were there under the surface kind of, but now are out in the open, um, that they could really also put some pressure on the Israelis to do that. But it seems that anytime someone tries to put pressure on an Israeli government, you know, they're fired, <laughs> they're, um, you know, they're labeled as something that's against uh, the Jewish people as a whole. And I don't think that that's anyone's intention. I mean, obviously, it's some people's intention, but overall, I think people would like to see this resolved and, and allow the Palestinians to have a state that they can actually govern and run on their own and ask for help when they need it. Yeah. And, and you know, what well, that kind of leads me to the next question. Why do you think we as Americans are so divided concerning the Israeli Hamas conflict and how does that division hamper our work to bring peace in the region? And I think you answered it in somewhat because if somebody is advocating uh, a two-state solution or has been critical of the Israeli government, they throw the word anti-Semitic at them in a minute. And right. you know, we literally had a member of Congress censured who is of Palestinian descent, who basically was like saying ceasefire, right? So how, how do we, how do we get to this point and how do we, how do we navigate around it to try to continue to have peace, uh, to, to try to achieve peace in the region? Well, I mean, I think, you you know, you kind of put put the hammer on the, <laughs> the head of the nail right there. I mean, or you, you pulled out the exact reasons. I mean, Rashida Talib, you know, Representative Talib, she, she has every right as a congressional representative of a community who does have a large number of Arab Americans as well to represent her people. And for there to them, for the Congress to censure her is just, I find it absolutely appalling that anyone is trying to silence a person who's looking for some solution to the situation. So, so there's not violence in the war. I mean, this is pretty nasty. 10,000 people have died within three weeks. Um, Plus, you know, plus or minus. So I think that we have to get down to the hard conversations and allow people to talk. Um, this is the first time I have seen people have the courage that they have had to step up and and be vocal. Um, I mean, there was a march in Washington. The Jewish community in New York basically set down, shut down Grand Central Station. Um, there have been marches all over the United States, which have rarely been covered, right? Because our media is also very controlled on what it can do and say. And this this all did not happen overnight. I mean, this has been a systematic campaign and and information strategy that Israel has had since the beginning of the state where they are. They have been victims. 
you know, the, the, in, in the Holocaust, which is absolutely true. Um, and therefore, the only place that they can be safe is in one country that is only Jewish. And those people that are trying to stop them all are, and anyone speaks out are either against them or terrorists. And so this has been long going, so it's not enabled anyone to be able to have a conversation again because they're very organized um, and and very quick to respond. And I'll probably get a lot of responses after this podcast today <laughs> um, to anyone who, who's you know who's who really speaks or criticizes not a people but a government. You know, the criticism is of the Israeli government. The criticism is not of a people. So I think there are two distinctions between there that we haven't been able to work out because people get way too emotional. Um, there's also a very strong lobby in Washington, the Israeli American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee um, that has been there since I learned about all of this. I actually did a paper on them like 20 years ago, 30 years, actually might be 30 years ago for now. Um, just at really looking at their lobbying techniques, how much money they have to spend, the influence they have on Congress. And believe me, it's much stronger now than it was then. And you can, you know, you look at the conference and you, you'll see every member of Congress at the, you know, Israeli Public Affairs Committee conference, and you'll see, you know, every president and and vice president, and so they're very powerful. And no one else, unless you're that powerful, you just don't have that kind of impact, and you wouldn't have that kind of of show and and support from a nation's government. So I, you know, again, like I said, this has been a long time. So I think this is all made. Um, it made it very difficult for people who understand that um, it's it's also about America's security interest, at, and those do not always align with Israeli security interests. And sometimes we have to think about how we need to balance those so that both um, are successful and. Right now, just mar the marginalization of the Palestinians has not worked since 1940s, and it's still not going away. So I think it really needs to be um, addressed forthright. And you know, I'm kind of disappointed in the Gulf countries that they would think about you know um, think about relationships and and opening relationships with the Israelis without understanding that. Um, this situation with the Palestinians is going to continue to cause problems with any of those movements forward. And I wouldn't be surprised, obviously, if I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the attacks or the attack that happened on August, October 7th wasn't a response to some of the, the new um, relationships that Israel is building with the Gulf. I mean, they exchanged ambassadors with Bahrain. They have a lot of very economic, you know, um, deals and, and relationships with the United Arab Emirates, uh, United Arab Emirates um, which, you know, is, is really great for, for all concerned. Um, but it still leaves out a whole group of people that have been struggling for justice and and for their own civil rights for you know 75 plus years now so that that's where the problems really exacerbate this on and make it ongoing so we don't see a stop yeah i i don't know and 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 so i i like to have people that are smarter than me to have this conversation because i just you know, when I was when I was first exposed to this and started paying attention uh, to to this conflict, you know, I was hip. You know, somebody hit me up to the game about repairing rights. That a lot of this issue was okay. Israel set up the state, and it's like, well, wait a minute, we gotta we gotta have access to the sea. We can't, you know, landlock ourselves. You know, so that's why Gaza is designed the way it is. You've got that little corridor between. Gaza and Lebanon, where Israel still has access to the sea, and then, you know, and I and I'm, I'm 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 not a 
scholar on this, so if I'm speaking in simplistic ter- terms, don't don't take it as an insult. But I, I just, you know, and then you know when I got real active in politics, you know, whenever the question came up, it was like my my position was a two state solution because it just made sense, and it seemed like in our best interest as well as the world's that. You know, if 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 the Israelis and the Palestinians could coexist, you know, mm-hmm. then then just let it let that happen. And what 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 I don't what I don't get is, or the question I have internally is, when will these politicians, not just here but in Israel and in Palestine, with the Palestinian Authority, you know, even uh, Hamas the radical arm and more radical arms than that that's floating around. When is, mm-hmm. when is the maturity going to kick in? Right. Cause when you're dealing with stuff, you use the term emotional and every time I, I listen to somebody from either side, it is very passionate. It's articulate and it's historically factual, but it's not rational. It's strictly on emotion. And I equate emotion when it comes to politics as immaturity. I think that when you get to a position where you're making decisions about societies, nations, the globe as a whole, that there has to be a certain level of maturity where it's like, yeah, okay, I I get the passion, but how are we going to make this work? And I have, and I have yet to see any generation of Israeli or Palestinian officials to speak from that level of maturity. And I, I, <laughs> feel free to comment on that if you want to, but I just. Well, again, you know, uh, I, I will say that I, I have seen both sides. I've seen very mature discussions about the situation and I've seen very immature discussions about the situation. Um, I think the immature discussions, unfortunately, win. And I, I can't, agree with you more. I think that when you're in positions of power, that's a time where your rationality really needs to kick in and your view and vision of vision. You need to have a vision of of where you you want to, you know, go and how you'd like to see the world. But I, I don't think a lot of our leaders are very responsible. I think they're very focused on themselves, their own power, their own, you know, whether it be just, you know, the power, the money, you know, I'm going to stay where I am, I have to be the one that that does this. And, you know, and, and sometimes that power, just, (laughs) it exudes emotion, right? Because you're you're like, don't even try to, but you know, (laughs) get where I am, or spar with me, or because I'm going to make this happen. And, you know, leaders have found out that emotions, uh, move the masses, right? Anything that has to do with religion or something that people are are very um, attached to in a historical sense or a personal sense causes emotion. And leaders have learned that emotion moves populations. And so they use it, ir- I would say irresponsibly, and in this case, very irresponsibly. Um, the Palestinians, I, I think one thing that we have to understand is the Palestinian Palestinian cause is a movement. The Palestinians have never been a state. So Israel is not fighting a state, which is often, I think, the discussion, oh, we're going to, you know, get rid of Hamas because they're the terrorist arm of that state. Well, no, they're not a state. They've never been a state. They're a group within the context of displaced people who have been basically in a refugee camp or whatever for the last you know, 30, 40 years, um, or, you know, so it's just, it's, it, it, we're not coming from this from logical viewpoints, you know, so um, it's, it's okay, it, it, you know, I just, I always find it very difficult, you know, it's just with the refu- well, with the hostage situation, this is what I find very difficult that I think people are missing, you know, the Israeli hostages are released, they go home, they're in a warm bed, a warm house, have dinner, have whatever, Palestinian hostages get released, they go home, 
the water may not be on, you know, the, the farmers can't, you know, cultivate their crops because the soldiers are out there shooting at them or, you know, taking over the fields. They're not going to, you know, safe places. And, and the, you know, the diametric difference in that to me is enough for any Western leader to sit down and say, wait a minute, you know, this is not what our, we have tried to build societies on. So it's just, it's been, a, you know, I think it's just a very difficult dynamic. We have been, you know, and to your point, we've been told certain things um, historically over and over and over again. And what are, if you repeat it enough, you start to believe it. And, and I think that as, as um, thinking uh, intelligent individuals, we have to do what, you know, you had said, I, we have to learn about it, not just take um, everything at face value. And I mean, I learned about it the same way. It was like, I was like, why are we giving the Israelis so much money, you know, <laughs> so, and weapons and all of this, you know, I was 20 something years old and I had no idea. I had no idea what was going on there and what had happened in the Belfour Declaration and the, you know, the Zionist movement versus, you know, just the, the, uh, be had, had making sure that anyone who suffered through repression in, in World War II and a Holocaust was safe. And, you know, so these are, these are dynamically different um, movements of people that are causing a, a larger problem because the people in charge are not gonna get in. 20 years ago, I had someone say to me, you know, a two-state solution is never gonna happen because of the right-wing part of Knesset. And so I was like, what? <laughs> you know, again, so I had to go do my homework and say, oh my God, who is the right wing part of the Knesset? And how much power do they have and all of this stuff? And, and I mean, this is this is stuff that you're like, what? <laughs> I, you know, who is that? What did that say? You know, I didn't, I, it, so it's doing really going back and doing your homework and say, wait a minute, you know? And, and it is kind of, you do have to kind of make it simple. You know, if someone came in my house and decided to take it over, I don't think I'd sit calmly and quietly. Right. It just, it just, that's just your basic, basic human instinct right there. So that's been going on now for 70 plus years. And we find ourselves in a worse situation than, you know, we, we have been. Yeah. This, this is a very dangerous situation and I would say the the hope that I or the good news um, that we've had so far and I don't know how much longer this is going to last is is that other parties in the region have not been 100% brought into to the conflict they've actually shown restraint and shown more um, common sense <laughs> if you will than and I, I probably would have thought they were going to do. Well, I, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of diplomacy, backdoor diplomacy going on and trying to keep other people out of the fight. Um, you know, just mm -hmm. making an analogy with the playground real quick. You know, it's just like you see two people fighting and, and you got friends, but then there's somebody in the crowd like going, no, 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 don't get involved in that. Just let them fight it out. Let them fight it out. It'll be over soon. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think the United States and some other countries might be doing that. I, I don't know. And it's probably best that I don't know, but I'm just saying, I think that's the, the restraint is because there's some other f entities going around saying, yeah, yeah, don't get into the fight just yet. But look, we, we're up against on the time, and um, I did want to get one question to you before we, we get out of here. Um, Henry Kissinger passed away. Uh, he lived mm -hmm. to be 100 years old. As somebody that has been dealing with that and how much of a influential figure he was in national security and foreign policy and so forth, what are your thoughts about him passing? My thoughts on Henry Kissinger are very torn. Um, and I will say that because on the one hand, he has been 
also accused of and found guilty of, of participating in, in war crimes. Um, we know, you know, situations in Chile and South America, Argentina. Um, so that's always very difficult for for me because even though <laughs> I know what happens in the world, I would like I, I try to to think positively and think that people want positive outcomes because if I don't stay on that track, I I won't be able to do this work anymore. Um, but on the other hand, he has always had a very geopolitically strategic mind. He has always understood how to move pieces um, and deal with leaders in a diplomatic manner and in a way that protects not only the United States, but um, finds ways that are always, that are beneficial to other nations. Um, now, did he do that every time? No, of course not. But he does have a very strategic mind. And I think that uh, we need people with that strategic thinking and critical thinking uh, mentality to be able to lead in a world where we have major, major pro just problems of global climate change or, or, you know, food insecurity and water shortages and all of these issues that are going on in poverty and starvation, even in our own country. Um, and we want to understand not only how to learn from the past and acknowledge the past, but use that to make a better future and think strategically uh, how to do that. Um, I, you know, I, I am not a believer of chastising China or Russia or all of these nations every five minutes and calling people names and and criminals and all of these things when you have to figure out ways to move forward in societies and in within the global context. Uh, you know, do I think everybody's right? No. Do I, am I going to be tough? Yeah. <laughs> I've been tough before I've been in Afghanistan, you know, and I think we need to be tough as a nation and stand up for our own rights. But I think we also be, have to be tough about what hurts everyone in a global context. And we're not that. Nobody is that. Um, so people are missing that um, vision of how to develop a future. There are definitely people out there thinking about it, but they're certainly not in politically leader, political leadership or positions or government leadership positions. So we need to figure out how to help get stronger minded people in those positions to move the world forward, not backward. And I think we're going two steps back. All right. Well, we're going to have to end it there. But before we go, how can people reach out to you and get in touch with you, track you down? How does that work? <laughs> I I do have a website. It's not very active right now, but you can uh, reach me on there at patriciadegenaro.com. And on social media, I have a Twitter account. It's Trisha's Take. And you can find me there. And that's probably the only place on social media that you'll find me. So. All right. Well, or an X account. I should say X account now. Well, I mean, you know, although we, I'm not sure Mal Malkin and Max would like that. Yeah, we're we're you know we're rebels. We still say Twitter. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's that's just kind of go. Look, uh, Mrs. Gennaro, thank you so much for taking the time out. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm going to try to get you back on because I'm. This is obviously not going to be the only thing we deal with, and it probably is not going to be resolved anytime soon no. but uh, uh, you have an open invitation to come back anytime you want so uh, again thank you for coming on I appreciate it and thanks for having me I really enjoyed being on your podcast thanks yes ma'am all right guys we're gonna catch y'all on the other All right, and we are back. And so now our final guest is going to be Ashraf Nubani. Ashraf Nubani is an American of Palestinian descent. 
immigrating from Kuwait in the early 70s as a child, Nubani has made it one of his life goals to bridge the gap between the common American perception of Islam and the actuality. In his effort to express these thoughts, Nubani began writing them down. Drawing upon his many years of experience as an attorney and Muslim serving sermon giver, Nubani has used his writing to boldly demonstrate the goodness, relevance, and staying power of Islam. An attorney known for representing the most vulnerable among us, Ashraf has a passion for challenging the odds and presenting Islam in the free marketplace of ideas. As an active member of the Muslim community, Ashraf Nubani hopes to expand in detail how Islam can be a powerful force in the modern era. When he is not advocating for the off the line, Nubani spends his spare time with his family. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct honor and privilege to have as a guest on this podcast, Ashraf Nubani. All right, Osroth Nubani, how you doing, sir? You doing good? I'm doing well, thank you very much. It's great it's, to be here. It's, it's good to have you. Um, so I wanted you on to talk about your experience as a Palestinian American and what's going on. But before we get into that, um, what I like to do with guests is throw out a quote, right? And it may be something that that person has said, that person has written about, um, or something that pertains to the subject matter that we're going to discuss. So your quote is, I cannot let the animosity of others toward me, Muslims, or the oppressed derail me from acting justly in my beliefs and toward all society. What does that quote mean to you? Uh, that, yeah, that um, that may have, it's either in a, an article or in my book. And this actually comes from, uh, it comes from verse of, of, of the Quran. So it, it has the utmost uh, importance. And, and, and that's what it means to be a Muslim is you sub, as a human being, you submit your will to, to, to something that's greater. And obviously, in this case, the creator of all. And therefore, we take these verses very seriously. And there's a verse that basically tells it's, it's, it tells the Muslims that you cannot let um, hatred that you may have for a group or a group may have for you. So just not letting an animosity itself swerve you away from practicing implementing justice when where, where justice is, is is demanded, and that's based obviously on religious principles that you will find in in Islam, in Christianity, in Judaism. And it may be a tough thing to do for, for us as human beings historically, and especially today, where, you know, there, there's so much division in society and uh, people don't understand each other. And when there's no understanding and there's no engagement with the other side, a lot of animosity and hatred builds up. And so I make it a point to to try to understand people, to try to understand groups and to engage so that when animosity occurs, that it doesn't, again, swerve me away from implementing justice as best as I can. Uh, And so that's what it means to me. All right. So the Washington Post stated in the title of an article uh, that, that covered you. And it said that you were the blind attorney who drove himself into bankruptcy defending accused terrorists. One, is that really a fair characterization of you? And two, how are you doing? How how has everything been going? From what I see, and of course this is audio only. From what I see, you seem to be doing okay. So, <laughs> yeah, that, I actually I didn't. I mean, it's it's out there in in in, in the internet, and sometimes uh, I, I point people to that article as a sort of badge of honor. Uh, it was so it was a hit job. Uh, the reporter at the time came to me, you know, saying that he does uh, society and, and, and law. And, you know, he found me very interesting. And he said he was going to do the story anyway. And I actually gave him access. And I think that he, you know, I gave him access, meaning to my friends, my family, uh, uh, you know, in fact, my mother, my, my, my daughter and friends of mine. And 
it was unfortunate that he he just had bad intentions. He was looking for something bad, but he couldn't find anything. Um, but this is the way that they wanted to portray me. Of course, this is just one as my my legal practice and the cases that I've taken on over the years, even before 9-11, I just a part of are just one segment of of the you know of of obviously my life and of uh, my career as an attorney, um, but but I think that that's what makes headlines for them, and I think that as a Palestinian um, who's outspoken on Palestine and certainly as a Muslim advocate within the larger community, um, that I was a target for for people uh, in, in in the Washington Post, but 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 I am I actually it's a badge of honor I represented. Uh, Muslims and other people who were caught up uh, in 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 the criminal the criminal justice system, which we all know has has its huge failings. Um, but but I think that you know as practitioners we try to 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 show the best side of what America has to offer. Meaning you know you don't give up on the system and you 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 do uh, what you can. You implement the Constitution. You make the the government has to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, when 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 there are um, uh, transgressions or when there are violations, you have to point it out and so forth. And I think that that's what you know. That's what I uh, try to do. I think that the article itself, it, when you're specific, you know, um, uh, when you're talking about the article, uh, I think that was a little bit more fair than 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 the title. I do happen to be um, what's considered legally blind, which means my vision is 20 uh, over 200. Um, I'm not allowed to drive, but I can read, I can, I can write, I can, you know, I do everything for myself. Uh, and so that's not, a, that's not an issue, but I think it's just the kind of sensationalism that they were looking for um, in order to, uh, to sell their newspapers. Yes, sir. All right. Let, let's take the audience back at this moment. You were in high school in Chicago. By the way, which high school did you go to? I went to Carl Schur's High School in on Milwaukee Avenue in the northwest side of Chicago. Okay, I went to Lindblom Tech over on Walcott. So yeah, I I can relate to where Schur's was. Um, so you go to a store, and you ask someone working at the store to make you a shirt that said "Free Palestine" on one side, and "PLO" on the other. What was your motivation, and did you understand the impact of the political statement you were making at that time? No, not at, not at all. And uh, so I'm, so I came to the U.S. Uh, as a, um, as a, as an immigrant with with my family, with my parents, in 1971. And we actually we came to Chicago, where 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 I grew up, um, and lived there for for I mean until I went to went to college, obviously. But I was around 16. It was 1982. And actually, so this is what's happening now in Gaza is reminiscent of what happened in 1982 when when Israel invaded Lebanon, uh, southern Lebanon, and went all the way up to Beirut. And that summer, before it was all over, uh, at least now the, the Lebanese say that 30,000 civilians were killed. Other reports put it down as low as 16,000. So we can put it in the middle, but it's similar to the scale that we see now. And in that case, they they, they stayed there from uh, for for a long time until they were finally kicked out uh, by by the Hezbollah uh, Shiite militia in, in 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 Lebanon. Twenty years late, like eighty two. Yeah, it was uh, almost twenty years later. Uh, they tried to keep a presence in 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 Lebanon, but so what that summer. There was a massacre in the Palestinian camps in Beirut after Arafat and his militia left uh, the the uh, city, according to a ceasefire agreement that had been brokered at the time. And uh, the 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 Chris, a Christian Falange militia slaughtered nearly three thousand Palestinians. So if we want to play identity identity politics, this was the nine eleven for Palestinians. And this was done under the auspices of the Israeli army who lit flares, who knew that they were coming into the camps for that purpose, and they, they basically helped them to do that. Um, and, and, and so that just as a, as a, as a teenager at 16 years old, uh, that really got me thinking. And I identified as a Palestinian, but what does that mean? 
America was a great experience, you know, in, in Chicago in, in, in the 70s and the early 80s, in the sense that, um, you know, I went to a high school and, and a school that had, uh, that had children from all, all over. We, there were blacks, there were whites, there were Hispanic, there were Oriental, uh, you know, people from, um, from Korea and other places. And so I thought America is great. You could say any, like, I really believed in that experience uh, growing up because it was actual. Yeah, there, I don't know if there was discrimination per se, um, but I didn't really see it, at least not at, not at Schur's, um, you know, initially. So, so I th thought everything was dandy. So what does it mean to be a Palestinian? I just put PLO is the Palestine Liberation Organization. And, and, and then I um, just wore the shirt, started wearing it to school, and it became an issue at school and had to go to the ACLU in order to resolve the, the situation, which was actually resolved really quickly because, <laughs> because I didn't know at the time, but that was freedom of speech. I mean, it, it's just crazy to think that, you know, there was an attempt to prevent me from wearing uh, a shirt that was clearly political speech and, and freedom of expression. And, uh, we, you know, we, we didn't end up going to court because of it, but it, it, it had to go through a, a, a semi-legal process in order to obtain that. So, and, and there's a story behind that, um, depending on how much you want to know. But um, we were, I was with one of my friends and, you know, she, you know how the high schools are at, in, in, in uh, especially Shores, I think was a school that had probably two, 3,000 students at any given time, you know, from freshmen all the way up to, uh, to, to the senior level. And so walking in the halls, all of a sudden, I hear one of the teachers yelling, his name was was Burke, and he was the drama teacher. And I didn't even know that he was Jewish at the time, but he was talking to another teacher saying, I don't care what anyone says, I'm going to get that shirt off of his back. And I was, you know, so I was kind of intimidated because I, I didn't get in trouble with the, with the principal previously, at least up until that point. And, um, you know, wasn't really a troublemaker, but, but, but um, type, I ended up being a lawyer because of it. So um, I think <laughs> talking back and fight, you, you learn that you don't get your, you, you don't get your rights and our African-American brothers know that you don't get your rights, you know, by, by, you have to fight for them. They don't come to you on a silver platter. If you don't fight for them, you don't get them. That's right. And so, but I, I went to the homeroom teacher. He was, uh, he was Italian um, named uh, Mario Cortesi. Um, and, and he said, look, I told him what's going on. He said, I'm going to tell you something, but if you say that I said it, I'm not, uh, I'm going to deny it. There's a group called the ACLU, have your parents call them. So I ended up doing that. Finally got my father, um, who, you know, in, like any other immigrants, they wanted to come to the United States for a better life. He wanted, you know, to work, keep his head low and, you know, low, low, low to the, to, to the stone just working and, and, and that kind of, he's like, why do you want this trouble? And he said, dad, didn't you tell us we're, Pal I don't understand. You told us we're Palestinians. This is, he says he wants to get this off my back. What did I do? Um, and, and we ended up going to the ACLU and uh, there was letters between the Board of Education of Chicago and uh, the ACLU. And then I got a letter saying, you can wear your shirt. And I started wearing my shirt to the point that I don't even know what happened to that shirt, meaning <laughs> that I just wore it until meant nothing to me anymore, um, but I wanted to exercise my right to do it. And 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 Gallagher, so the, the principal, his name was Gallagher, a uh, Catholic Irish guy, tall guy. And he saw me in the hallways after that, and he gave me a thumbs up after I had won my, even though he was the one that prevented me from wearing it. But, you know, it was, so it was a sweet victory. It was, uh, and that's what got me on the road to becoming an attorney. Um, actually, that was one of the pivotal points in, in my life. And then I learned what the PLO was and, um, you know, what it means, free Palestine and, and, and now why from the river to the sea, you know, how, how, how they play that game that it's anti-Semitic and, 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 and so forth, when it's really a struggle for freedom uh, that everyone can identify with and people all over the world are identifying whether they're Muslim, Christian, you, you know, secular, atheist, uh, West, East, uh, it's just across the board because human beings understand freedom. Uh, people want dignity and people understand what subjugation is. And, and, and so I think things come full, full circle. Yeah. And, and at, being a former employee of the ACLU in Mississippi, I definitely understand the power of an ACLU letter. Uh, so I'm glad uh, that, that, that happened for you at a young age and it led you to what you're doing now. 
In your book, you ask the question, why don't more Americans support the Palestinian cause? In the midst of this current crisis in Gaza, have you found that answer? Yes, and it's a resounding, uh, it's a resounding, you know, uh, positive uh, uh, response that, you know, we have not forgotten Palestine, we have not let Palestine down. And I've always had hope in the people, but the, the reasons why Americans, at least up until this point, and now we're, you know, it's an it's a intergenerational uh, uh, um, uh, issue, meaning that the older the people are, the more likely they're to support Israel, let's say, the younger they are, the more likely they're to support the Palestinian cause. And that's just based on the attrition of education over time. I always felt, as I said, uh, I always felt that people would would always side with with right over wrong as as a group, as a society. And I think that they've done that in the United States. The polls bear that out. But for a long time, you know, they were they were um, uh, th their voices were, were were shut down because of our political system. And it's still going on. I mean, even today, obviously, with our Congress, these are people that we elect that don't represent the 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 wishes the clear uh you know directives of their constituents and uh, across the board in 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 all, so many of these districts uh, uh, throughout the United States and 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 you know the states uh, themselves for the senators are they saying we want a ceasefire and yet the United States um it, it, you know has not until now uh, agreed to any sort of ceasefire so so i i am very uh, hopeful and i you know, I think in, in that chapter when I talked about Palestine, I think I gave five, six reasons why I believe, and this was before, obviously, this war, why Israel is not going to be around for a long time. And I still believe that whether it's in my generation or, or not, as a Muslim, that's not even important. For me, God, you know, expects of us to do our job and the result is with him. But why is that so powerful? I think it's powerful because it allows me to see the victory, it, 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 meaning in, even if it's in, in the afterlife, even if it's after me, but I believe in it as if it's happening. And if, we, uh, and if we're able to do that, then we can see you know, the fruits of our uh, efforts come to, to fruition, whether it's through us or through our children or a different generation. So for me, it's a done deal. It's 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 over, and it doesn't mean. And obviously, we can get into it. It has nothing to do with any type of hatred um, for 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 Jewish people who are our cousins, as you know, because Arabs and Jews uh, and Hebrews come from Abraham, and Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and and, and Isaac. So that's not even uh, an issue. But the state of Israel and the apartheid that it represents, and the um, the birth of that state. Uh, at the expense of the indigenous population, who who were uh, who, who who were dispossessed, you know, en masse, uh, over seven hundred thousand made refugees, and now these are the children and the children and and grandchildren of those refugees. Um, so the the situation in that respect has only gotten worse, and there has to be a rectification of you know of that. So I'm actually very positive um, in terms of what I'm seeing here in the United States, especially with the young folk. So you kind of touched on it. Explain in detail, uh, as a Palestinian, what do you mean when you refer to the Israeli occupation? So the, the Israeli occupation, um, for, for me as a Palestinian, of course, it means all of, all of historical mandate Palestine. It means uh, for, from, the, from the Mediterranean Sea to the, uh, to the Jordan River and from in the north bordering Lebanon to, to the south, bordering, uh, bordering, bordering Egypt at the Sinai Peninsula. That's, uh, that's, historical, that's historical Palestine. And um, uh, that's what I mean when I say occupied uh, uh, Palestine. Yeah. It's not, just the, it's not just the territories of 1967. But, but Palestinians, if the question is, you know, whether pa Palestinians have, from with all of their strands, meaning their political and religious uh, leanings, have always, for I mean, historically speaking, have accepted a two-state solution. I, I, of course, after 1948, why would they at the time? I mean, so these are, you know, Zionist talking points that, you know, the United Nations offered this. First of all, they offered the, the Palestinians who owned 93% of the land were going to get um, we're going to get uh, 45 or 46% of the land 
and the Israelis who owned 7% of the land or less were going to get 55% of the land. So it went, you know, they wouldn't have accepted it at the time and there was no reason to accept it. And of course, it was one of the first things that the United Nations did and the United Nations was, was, was a reflection of what happened after World War II and the failure of the nation of the League of Nations, which was its predecessor. And now, you know, all these years later, 75 years later, we're seeing the utter futility and failings of, you know, this liberal, secular, uh, uh, outlook that you know we were promised in 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 the West that 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 w people are going to be treated fairly and 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 now you see that when America wants to veto they can veto the whole world it had to go to the General Assembly and the General Assembly overwhelmingly voted in the United Nations for a ceasefire and yet has not come about yet so um, uh, so when when I talk about occupied Palestine I'm talking about all of Palestine it has nothing to do with uh, harming Jews. It has to do with returning uh, our rights. And they have a, you know, they, they can live in, in the land, but not as usurpers, not at the expense of the indigenous population that lives there. You can have a Jewish state um, and, and a democracy for Jews, or you can have an apartheid state, but you can't have both. You can't, you know, you, you, you can't have a Jewish state and a democracy. You either have a democracy uh, for everyone, including the Palestinians who live on that land, and then it would be one man, one vote, and then things would 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 change, and there would be no Israel. Or you continue what you what what they currently have, which is an apartheid state, where you have to use your military, get the, get the backing of the United States, and um, oppress and kill upwards of twenty thousand people uh, in 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 order to maintain your apartheid state, and and that's just not going to be doable for the long run. Do you think a, a two-state solution would uh, will eventually come, or do you envision... All right, so let me break it down like this. Do you think that it's more feasible to create a two-state solution or to create a country of Israel where Palestinians and is uh, Jewish uh, people of faith could live in uh, together? And it wouldn't be like a section, the West Bank, a section Gaza. It'll be all one country, but everybody would have equal say. Which, which one is more realistic? So, okay, that's a good question. In terms of what, so obviously both, so if you ask both, so if you ask Israelis, obviously the majority, let's say, and you ask Palestinians, the majority of Palestinians, each side has their own narrative. It's very clear. The Jewish narrative is, um, and, you know, I'm going to describe it, uh, and and you know those who have a, a, an issue with it, they can uh, they can you know chime in um, with their with their views. Jews, whether they're religious or secular, and secular here meaning that they don't believe in religion. Some of them don't believe in God. Don't even be believe that Moses existed or Abraham even existed. But whether they're religious or not, they there seems to be some claim to that land over a period of thousands of, of years. For a religious Jew, he will say that this was granted to us by God, and this belongs to the Jewish people and only to the Jewish people. The Jewish people must exercise sovereignty, and it's actually beyond the borders of Mandate Palestine. In, in, it, it, it's actually, they claim that it's from the Euphrates to, to, the, to the Nile, based on, on, on um, you know, based on the old kingdom and, and, and what they expect. However, um, even secular Jews do not um, do say, look, we're not religious, we don't believe in God, but we have this culture. Uh, Jew, Jew, um, being Jewish is an identity that goes through the mother and it's tied to the religion, even if we don't believe it. Um, but it makes us Jewish, and we have long-standing ties to this land, and therefore we have a right to be here uh, at the expect at the expense of the indigenous population. Now there are you know there are Israelis or Jews who will say that we're ready you know to a state solution, but they're now an absolute mi minority. The Palestinian side, whether they're religious or secular, will say, look, um, this was a usurpation of of our land, and just the fact that there was no Palestine, quote unquote, which is one of the Zionist talking points, which actually is a joke because people 
just hear talking points, but they don't look a little deeper. And I just want to, you know, dive in a little bit and say that, yes, there was never a formal Palestine, but that's the whole point is when did the, 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 idea, the idea of a nation state grew in France and, 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 and Germany previously after the fall of the Hungarian Empire and, and Germany, you know, unified and, and, and so forth? This idea of a nation state was arising based on on liberal uh, secularism, but but the third world, the global, what we call now the global South, people were not getting. The, I mean, India became a state in 1947, and Pakistan in 19, you know, in 1947, Algeria fought a revolution from 1954 until 1962 when it became a state. Kuwait became a state in 1962. The point is, is that the Palestinians were doing the same thing. They were fighting uh, uh, from, you know, after World War I, uh, when, when, when Britain occupied that area, up until World War II and beyond, trying to fight for their own state as well. So when people say, but well, you know, there was never a Palestinian people, it doesn't matter. Pal the, those people living on that land were called Palestinians, just like someone coming from, you know, what we call China, we'll say Chinese. They may be different ethnic groups. There are Han Chinese. There are other, you know, other ethnic uh, Chinese, but they're all Chinese because they come from this land called China. And so, you know, this idea that they didn't, they never had a nation state and so forth is, is, is just a red herring. It, it's not applicable. So Palestinians will say that that land belongs to us and it was taken by force. It was, it was um, Britain who had no right to the land gave it to a third party that had no right to the land and the Palestinians uh, were kicked out of their land. And so a Palestinian will say, we, 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 that all of that land belongs to us and we fight for that land, whether it's in, in um, uh, um, peaceful means or uh, armed resistance, which is recognized by all international law uh, in Christianity, with the Catholicism, you have the idea of just warfare. It's recognized in Islam. It's recognized in in in, in other religions as as well. And so, the Palestinians would say that that belongs to us. However, most Palestinians, at least up until recently, were willing to have a two state solution, including Hamas. Uh, they they because it's an Islamic organization, they couch it under the understanding of what's called the Hudna. Which is a which is a, a cessation of violence uh, for a period of time uh, that that can be renewed generationally or when when the term expires. So it's just a way of saying, hey, look, let's just stop fighting each other. Our we're going to guarantee each other's security. Let you know us build our 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 state, and we'll just kick this can down the road. Why? Because we're both not giving up our narratives. The question is, how do you get to a resolution? So, so the, um, the, 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 so that's, you know, that's sort of laying the groundwork. So to answer your question, so we could look at it in two ways. So there is what, you know, Jews want or Israelis, the majority of them. And then there's what Palestinians want, let's say the majority of them. And that's still, um, you know, the, the entire land for only one group, uh, for, for, but, but then, so what, that's what they want. So I think, um, in terms of what will happen, we don't know, and I, you know, no one can predict the future. But I think that these are the these are the the scenarios in, let's say, the short term. In the short term, the United States, unfortunately, and I don't mean it to attack my country. I'm saying, unfortunately, they still have the ability to 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 you know they have power in the Middle East, which is unfortunate because we shouldn't be in other countries' uh, business without a good reason. And supporting Zionism over the rights of the indigenous Palestinian population is not a good reason, but we are, you know, uh, intricated there, unfortunately. And as long as America wants the continuation of the state of Israel in its form, they will play games in order to set up another, you know, another um, dodging method that will sort of subdue the growing anger <clears throat> in the Middle East and <clears throat> try to come up with something uh, that is a semi-autonomous, you know, uh, um, uh, setup that, that, again, will say will lead to a, a Palestinian state. And the reason I say it won't lead to a Palestinian state, they don't want it. And if, 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 if the Arab countries, for example, like Egypt, the dictator in Syria, in Egypt, Sisi said that, 
we want a Palestinian state, but this Palestinian state will be demilitarized. Well, that is means absolutely nothing for us as Palestinians, as human beings. That's a non-starter. That's a joke to say, I'm going to give you a state, but you don't have the rights of a state. One of the basic rights of any state is the ability to defend itself. And, it, you know, it, it, if it can't do that for itself, then it doesn't have the catchings of, of, a, of a state. And so I think that if the, you know, the big powers want uh, to clamp down on the current uh, violence and try to um, uh, contain uh, what is obviously, you know, may blow up in a way that no one is going to be able to stop, meaning neither the puppet governments or the United States or Israel, uh, if, if, the, if the war widens. So they're trying to, 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 to make sure that there's no escalation they will pay lip service to a Palestinian state and try to set something up. Now, if that's unsuccessful, which I think eventually will be, then the result will be one state. And I think that it will be in the favor of the Palestinians for the reasons that I give in my book. One of them is the demographics. Palestinians still are outnumbering Israelis over time, and they will continue to do so in the near future, even if they kill slaughter 20,000, you know, and, and up, upwards of seven, 8,000 children, um, the, the Palestinians will still uh, 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 demographically be more than, than the Israelis in the future. Two, um, the Palestinians drink polluted water, forget Gaza where they've been prevented from having water, but even in the West Bank where the water wells are underneath lands, uh, areas supposedly controlled by the Palestinian Authority, which is the ruling administration that was implemented after Oslo in 1993. They're really not in any way independent because Israel still controls everything. But they steal water from those under uh, under uh, un, uh, under land uh, aquifers and, and they send it towards Israel where where people in the settlements may have swimming pools while while Palestinians are drinking polluted water. Now, why do I say that? So it's to say that a Palestinian has no choice but to live and fight on the land of his and, and, and her you know, grandparents going back generations, uh, a, a, mill a millennium, meaning over a thousand years and beyond, um, they have no choice. Whereas Israelis who came from Poland, Germany, Lithuania, Russia, wherever they came from, right? And, not, and it's not to say that Jews do not have a tie to the land. I, I, we would never say that. But those who came from Europe, those they have, some of them have dual citizenship. Some of them have family in those places and they can leave. And that's what's going to happen when things become difficult because they set up a little, you know, uh, um, paradise for themselves, but on the skulls and at the expense of the indigenous population. And you just can't maintain that. And so I think that's eventually what's going to happen is there will be a one state solution. Then the question becomes, is it going to be through violence or is it going to be peace? And this is the unfortunate reality of the history of human beings is God lays out things to us clearly. He, he's, he says, you do good, you get good in return. You do bad, things aren't going to go well for you. You have the choice. And it's a struggle. We struggle with ourselves personally as human beings against our soul. That's why I said that, <clears throat> that you know, believing in the unseen God makes you the freest person on earth because you don't submit your will to anything Accept God alone, the unseen creator. You don't, you don't submit your will to a, to, to a human being, to an influencer, to status, to money, to power, to sex, to politicians, to politics, to anything or any kind of whim, but you submit it to, to God. And that's what makes you, uh, makes you free. And so I think, that, um, I think that what will eventually happen is that um, if, the, you know, if, if the Israelis do not dismantle their apartheid state, and have reconciliation and return rights, that there is no choice but that it will end up violently. And if it ends up violently as it is now, they're going to lose. Um, because, not just because Palestinians are not giving up, but it also has a religious component for Palestinians, even though it's not a religious war, meaning we're not fighting a religious war. If, if a Muslim did the same thing to, to us, we would be fighting. If someone kicked you out of your home, even if it's your brother, if he comes in with a gun, you're going to, you know, you may, you either say, okay, he's my brother, 
uh, you know, he's older than me and I'm weak, you know, that's fine. But the point is, no one would blame you for saying, you know, even if it's my brother, of course, I'm going to kick him out of my house. I'm not going to let him come in, you know, and take my my family belongings and, and harm my family. And so these are family for us. Uh, but we, we, we fight not because they're Jews, but because of what they did. And unless that's resolved, then it's not going to end up well, because Jerusalem means everything to Muslims as well as to Palestinians. And so even as Muslims, if we gave up on our rights, that doesn't mean that Jordanians, Egyptians, Syrians, Yemeni, look what Yemen is doing, firing missiles, those guys bless their hearts, you know, all the way from a thousand miles away or whatever the distance is to say that, you know, this is important to us. So it's not up to us. It's a religious site for, for, for Islam uh, as well as Christianity and Judaism. So, so just to briefly respond is, the hope is that it would be a one state uh, solution that incorporates everyone as much as possible uh, and it's not violent. That's the hope. The reality is, is that America and Israel are not ready to you know, return the rights that is within their ability to do and they're just going to kick the can down the road and so there will be more suffering and so forth and there will be talk about a two state solution. It's not an impossibility. The world votes on it every year at the General Assembly in September of uh, every year. Resolutions are brought before the General Assembly, and this resolution is brought, you know, based on 242, the exchange of land for peace and the return of refugees. And every single year out of the 190 odd nations of the world, member nation states in the United Nations, they overwhelmingly uh, um, vote for the two state solution. But it's vetoed, or it's it's yeah, it's not vetoed, but it's um, voted against by the United States, Israel, and then some odd number of countries, like you know six, seven other, uh, up to sometimes a dozen countries total, including Palau and uh, the Marshall Islands. You know these countries, they're not even countries, but they get money from the United States, and they're told you have to vote this way, and sometimes they even don't. You know, so it kind of circulates between these countries. And then you may have an odd country in South America and uh, who's receiving aid from the United States. So that's how it goes. So, so I think that, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, but unfortunately, um, as we see things unfolding now, it seems like America and Israel is not ready yet uh, for, for, for a just uh, resolution. All right. So we're up against it. And I, but I did want to get a couple more questions, so I'll combine them into one. What would you like President Biden to do concerning the current Israeli Hamas conflict? And do you think that this conflict will cost him the election in 2024? Yes, yeah, I think what I would like him to do is to even resign now. I don't think that he should run. And if he runs, he's going to uh, certainly the Muslim community has decided almost, you know, en masse that they're not going to allow Biden to become the president, which means wherever they have sway in those swing states, like in Michigan and other places, that they, you know, they will not vote. People will say, well, that means Trump or whoever will come in. I will say this, it, even if that's the case, it's not going to be worse than a president who's allowed, you know, genocide to occur under his watch. And so, it, you know, it's, uh, we'll kill you slowly or we'll kill you quickly, but we're going to kill you anyway, if that's the choice. Uh, I think that we, as, as the Muslim community who are becoming more engaged in politics, have to send a message that we, you know, we can make a difference when it comes to elections. What I would like to see him do is, of course, to not only call for a ce an immediate ceasefire, but force the Israeli government, which we give them all of the funds, and we give them the cover in the United Nations, we give them diplomatic cover and support and so forth, to tell the Israelis that you have to commit to a two-state solution, you know, and it's just going to happen. America can exercise, but they will never do it. But you ask me, what do I want him to do? That's what he should do. He won't uh, do that. And um, and 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 you said yeah. And I I don't. So to answer, I think both questions is that I think that um, I, I think that uh, Biden should not run uh, in in the next election. If he does, he's not going to win. All right, Osroff. If people want to follow up on this conversation and talk to you, uh, how do they get in touch? Um, I'm on Twitter uh, on as on point um, a w n point is my Twitter handle. Uh, unfortunately, I was on LinkedIn for a long time and just, you know, producing general content, content, and I got 
um, I, I, I was restricted and, and, and banned, did an appeal, nothing has happened so far. I don't know if I will pursue it or not, but I didn't know why. And it's obviously over this, uh, you know, sh shadow banning because of Palestine. But I think that um, we've beat the, 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 the logarithm and, and there's a lot of, um, you know, support. But that's the only thing I have now is Twitter at this point. Okay. All right. Osrov Nubani. Thank you, my brother, for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time and being, you know, and I gave you some time to really kind of get into it and explain uh, from your perspective. So, again, I, I thank you for that. And uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. And uh, we'll catch y'all on the other side. And so we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope that you picked up some perspectives and kind of got an idea of what is going on outside of the United States. And I hate that I only have 30 minutes per guest to really flesh these things out. But I hope that you got something out of that. Um, also, considering the time that this podcast is coming on, Merry Christmas to everybody. Even if you don't practice Christianity or whatever, I hope that this is a season of giving and sharing and love to each and every one of you. So with that thought, until next time.